the verses we take up today have been considerably quoted in popular culture and equally misinterpreted and misrepresented bhagavad gita chapter 2 verse 22 This is uh, even as a man casts off worn out clothes and puts on others that are new so the embodied one casts off worn out bodies and enters into others that are new now the confusion stems from not correctly seeing who is this embodied one who is this embodied one hmm? so the analogy goes this way just as a man casts off his old torn or soiled clothes and puts on new ones similarly the embodied one hmm, keeps on taking various bodily forms who is this embodied one in vedant the self truth atma does nothing as is evident in the previous few verses and in the ensuing ones it neither does anything nor can anything be done to it the reason is simple the entire field of subjects and objects and all relationships between them all actions of the subject all perception all actions of the objects all perceptions of the subjects action reaction pairs the entire flow of time all this belongs to the field of prakriti and atma self truth if the one that is not contained in the field of prakriti neither as object nor as subject it neither moves nor sees any movement it neither acts nor reacts and that is the reason why shri krishna has been emphasizing in this series of verses that atma neither kills nor is killed in verse 23 he says and it's a very famous verse that the truth the self cannot be cut by weapons burned by fire wetted by water or dried by wind no object can act on it 
nor is the self the actor. Hmm? All kinds of pairs of dualities and all triads belong to prakriti. If you see the mover, if you see the moved one, and if you see movement, all three are contained in prakriti. If there is the knower, if there is the known one, and if there is knowledge, all this is within prakriti. The killer, the killed one, and the killing, all this is within prakriti. Are you getting it? And what is within prakriti? With respect to you, the ego is just your bondage. To whom are these words being spoken? To the one in bondage, to Arjun. To the one who is suffering in want of liberation. Hmm? What exactly is the bondage of the ego everything in prakriti you have to get the logic very neatly else you too might uh, fall prey to the same kind of misinterpretations that have been going round and round Hmm? To the ego, prakriti is bondage, right? If prakriti is taken as an end, taken as a medium to attain liberation, prakriti is very much all right. But to think of prakriti as an end in itself, as the destination, as a finality, as an absolute, is a huge mistake that we are prone to make. This mistake is called avidya. Hmm? This ego starts taking stuff in prakriti as its destination. If I can get that, whatsoever is out there or in here, doesn't matter. In, out, everything is prakriti. Right, left, everything is. If I can get something from here or something from there or everything out there, then I'll be at peace or I'll be joyful. This is a cardinal mistake called avidya. Hmm? So, to the ego, prakriti represents bondage. That does not mean that Vedant hmm, repudiates prakriti or relegates it to an inferior position or talks of it in pejorative terms. It just says that prakriti cannot be the goal of your life. That's all. It does not say prakriti is something worthless or that prakriti being the bondage is an enemy. No, no, not at all. Prakriti is neither worthless nor an enemy. It is rather the only means available to you to achieve your destination. 
and since it is the only means possible to you therefore you have to respect it therefore in vedant prakriti has a very special place on one hand it is called maya that which limits you and confounds you troubles you hmm? on the other hand it being the only means for your salvation it is also worshiped so if you take prakriti as your destination then you have been charmed by maya trapped ensnared on the other hand if you are respectful towards prakriti if you can just watch prakriti and her ways without interference without the intention to exploit having the most respectful attitude then prakriti is a great help and therefore it is worshiped it is worshiped as devi shakti that does not mean that prakriti has two faces no it only means that you can have two possible attitudes if your attitude is stupid then prakriti to you is the greatest trap possible then to you prakriti will be called as maya but if you have some restraint and respect then to you prakriti is a blessing a great help an uplifting hand a beneficial resource resource is too little a word to be used hence we said blessing prakriti to you then is devi shakti right so let's be very clear vedant does not condemn prakriti vedant is not disrespectful towards prakriti in fact vedant is concerned with the liberation of the ego therefore whatever is to be said is said to the ego there is nothing in prakriti as such that can be even addressed so no point being respectful or disrespectful it is the ego that is being taught to look at things rightly and things denote prakriti are you getting it so to the common man to the ego prakriti is a charm a trap a snare a noose hmm and what is the characteristic of prakriti anything that ever took birth took shape took form is prakriti anything that is perceptible through senses is prakriti and even the senses are prakriti so we said all subject object pairs are prakriti getting it having seen that you are said that now you must realize that your bondage is improper association with prakriti prakriti is not the bondage the cause of bondage is your own false perception your own clouded vision you could not see what the world inside and outside is all about and therefore you got into 
फॉल्स रिलेशनशिप्स इम प्रॉपर एसोसिएशन दैट इज एट द हार्ट ऑफ ऑल योर ट्रबल्स इम प्रॉपर एसोसिएशन दैट ऑब्जेक्ट इन इट सेल्फ इज नाइदर गुड नॉर बैड इट इज द नेचर ऑफ रिलेशनशिप दैट यू हैव विद दैट ऑब्जेक्ट दैट रेंडर्स दैट ऑब्जेक्ट आइदर यूजफुल और हार्मफुल टू यू in itself the object means nothing there has to be somebody to whom the meaning holds good otherwise the object cannot have any meaning the moment you say the that object has a meaning good bad pretty ugly the vedanti will ask to whom to whom <laughs> useful useless to whom so objects do not carry meanings it is the ego that is vested with the responsibility to find the right meanings in objects and we fail to do that we fail to do that we load objects with meanings that they cannot carry all objects are finite no object is capable of carrying the burden of infinite meaning on itself but we look at an object are charmed by it and start projecting the infinite on it the object would crumble the object cannot stand infinite load when the object crumbles the ego blames the object are you getting it hmm therefore it is very important to see things as they are which basically means that when something starts appearing very important you must make sure to know its exact location it is appearing so important is it really the sky or is this something in the field of the earth where is it really located if you can see something in its right location you will cease to be enamored it is only when you forget the right address of something do you start thinking of it as something from the skies shri krishna is telling arjun the right address of things arjun all these that you are looking at they are just the ego and its objects none of them is the truth none of them is the self the atma and if they are the ego and its objects they belong to prakriti how have you forgotten that the prakriti is your bondage you are giving so much consideration to your bondage are you such a fool what is the body an object to the ego the ego is the subject the body is the object just as everything else is an object to the ego the body too is an object to the ego there is nothing neither in the body nor in the ego that is to be valued so much but sir what is to be valued then to you only your liberation is valuable but instead of your liberation you are taking all these people standing in front of you as holding infinite value 
great value, infinite value, belongs only to your own liberation. It does not belong to those bodies out there. If those bodies have value, then even the clothes that you are wearing, Arjun, they have great value. Those bodies are objects to the ego in just the same way as your clothes are objects to you. How much importance do you want to give to your clothes? Hmm? But you are treating these clothes as the absolute. And hence you are forgetting your duty towards the absolute. You are mislocating the absolute. You are seeing the absolute where it is not. You are seeing the absolute in the bodies of those who stand out there to fight you. The absolute does not belong there. And of value is only the absolute. Therefore, you should not hesitate in fighting them. There is no value. Not in their body, not in your body. Not in the preservation of their ego, not in the preservation of your ego. The value lies only in liberation. Do what is needed for your liberation. Hmm? Getting? The self is too big to wear any clothes. Let alone cast them aside and put on new ones. So let nobody say that the verse talks of the Atma taking on bodies and then discarding them in due course and then entering new bodies. How can the infinite enter a finite body? If the great self is infinite, how will it enter a puny body? But that's the way the verse has been interpreted. The great self lives inside the body. And then it keeps on changing bodies. The body is a thing in Prakriti. And the great self by definition has nothing to do with Prakriti. How will it ever enter an object in Prakriti? This body is Panchabhut. Just material, physical elements. How can the infinite, the untouchable, the unthinkable, the unimaginable, Enter water, fire, <laughs> sand, such things. So there is no way that Atma, which is the highest truth in Vedant, hmm, takes on bodies or discards them. No. That's not the meaning here. Subject-object pairs are all located within Prakriti. Who is the eternal subject? The ego. Hmm? The ego tendency is the eternal subject and in com on coming in touch with different objects, it takes different names, different forms. Whatsoever you call as sentient is nothing but a form taken on by the ego tendency. And depending on the form, the sentient being thinks of an identity for itself. So the goat will say, I am a goat. The tiger will say, I am a tiger. The man will say, I am a man. I am a woman. I am old. I am sick. I am hungry. I am rich. What is common in all these? I am. This I am is the eternal ego tendency. It is the eternal subject in Prakriti. The eternal subject 
in prakriti not to the prakriti within prakriti is the ego tendency i am i am and it is the eternal subject so it relates to different objects when it relates to different objects it attaches a predicate to i am so i am goat i am sand in its own way the sand particle is conscious i am sand i am the tiger i am the bacteria i am the insect getting it what does prakriti comprise of the eternal ego tendency and an eternal infinite number of objects that's prakriti dualistic subject and object that ego tendency in combination with different objects takes on different names all the objects are in the field of in the sway of time therefore they rise in time and they fall in time hmm? this in common parlance is called birth and death irrespective of the object that the ego tendency has attached itself to there would be a dissociation in time and then there is some other object that the tendency attaches itself to the process is obviously not linear at any given moment the tendency is attaching itself to billions of objects and at the same time there are billions and trillions of dissociations called deaths it's all happening concurrently it's not as if it's one thing that is sequentially attaching and detaching itself to a chain of objects no are you getting it so shri krishna is saying all this is in the purview of prakriti and prakriti is not your destination arjun your destination is up there why are you so besotted with something that is happening down here and arjun would say but sir i too am down here so why should i not be concerned with what is happening here krishna would say you are here but you are not to remain here therefore you should relate with this dimension in a way that liberates you from this dimension huh? the beautiful thing that he is saying he is saying relate to be liberated hmm? or relate to liberate or put completely relate to liberate and be liberated getting it what is to be done with this universe around us despise it loathe it condemn it spit at it and say oh this is such a despicable thing it has put me in chains and enslaved me do this wallow in it chew it munch it embrace it huh be all over it let it be all within you what neither of these no that you are stuck here at the same time only this will take you out you are stuck here you are stuck within it but the way out is through the maze like being lost in a jungle 
यू आर लॉस्ट इन द जंगल बट द वे आउट इज थ्रू द जंगल नो बडी इज गोइंग टू एयर लिफ्ट यू यू हैव टू बिफ्रेंड द जंगल द वुड्स द एनिमल्स द बर्ड्स द ग्रास द टेरेन द विंड्स you must befriend all of them and when you befriend them they show you the way out equally you must neither resign to your fate and say now that i am inexorably trapped let me just build a little hut here getting out is out of question therefore just let me settle down peacefully no nor are you to get angry at the jungle and burn it down or hack it down no you are not to be enchanted you are not to settle down you are also not to burn it down you are to befriend it you have to ask the leaves and the twigs the rabbits and the wolves what is the secret where does all this come from and how does one get out of here that's the way of vedant that's what shri krishna is trying to teach arjun in his own way arjun is bewitched arjun is under a spell the spell comes from the body the experiences the society the whole game of upbringing the panorama of experiences relationships shri krishna is saying all of that is within the jungle and your home is in the sky where you stand arjun at this moment in time this battle is your only way to meet the sky hmm? providence has brought to you to a point where if you now refuse to fight you are refusing to be liberated you the importance that you are giving to your relatives and to your relationships is misplaced that importance duly belongs to right action not deep emotion getting it you are bemoaning death as a great tragedy no death is not a great tragedy arjun the great tragedy is life in bondage but you are acting as if these bodies falling would be the greatest sorrow possible no the greatest sorrow 
is when the body keeps upright and acting and walking. in chains. In the effort to be free, if the body falls, that can hardly be called as a tragedy. Tragic is when the fettered body makes peace with the chains and makes no attempt to be free in the fear that an attempt to be free might bring about pain or destruction to the body. You are making a very fundamental mistake, Arjun. You are treating the field of Prakriti as more important than the truth, the sky, the joy of liberation. Your emotions are Prakriti, their bodies are Prakriti, your memories are Prakriti, your relationships are Prakriti. You cannot care for them beyond a point. You cannot think of them as the maximum. The maximum is none of these. Hmm? Uh, look at the fantastic irony. The verse that was meant to emphasize to Arjun that the Atma, the truth, is beyond everything material, including the material body. The same verse has been repeatedly used to prove that the Atma wears the body. Can irony get more delicious than this? Since centuries and today, everywhere this verse is quoted to prove that the Atma is eternal and it keeps taking on and discarding bodies. When one body is done, the Atma enters some other body. That's the way this verse has been used. Whereas this verse is intended to show exactly the opposite. That the Atma will remain always untouched by bodies. The entity that is in play with bodies is the jivatma, the ego, the embodied one. Shri Krishna uses the word dehi, dehi, deh, even etymologically means limitation. And the great self is unlimited. How can dehi be used to mean Atma. There is no way. But that's the way of popular culture. It appropriates even the highest of texts to uphold its own assumptions, beliefs, traditions, biases. I have a bias. Therefore, I look at a sacred text and deliberately misinterpret it in a way that upholds my bias. Is the text really sacred? No. The fact is my bias is sacred to me. That is the way of the ego. 
for the ego nothing is more important or sacred than itself hmm? so the bodies are burnt the truth is not that's the next verse you can neither dismember the truth nor burn it wet it or dry it all these things happen to objects in prakriti so if something can be killed it is anyway not the truth if something can be done to something that something is anyway not the absolute the absolute is absolutely impregnable nothing in prakriti has any command over the absolute these arrows are not even pin pricks to the atma and you are so mournful that with these arrows you will be able to cut a great thing apart no the thing that will be cut apart by your arrows is anyway just some material object in the prakritik field not worth grieving for the real is not vulnerable to your arrows arjun when you say oh i don't want to kill you are pretending as if you can kill the thing is you cannot kill that which you are calling as killing is nothing but a child's play happening since eons in the prakritik field shri krishna is not saying kill on the contrary he is telling arjun you cannot kill therefore shoot the arrow anyway nobody is going to be killed those who will be killed are unreal and the real cannot be killed therefore why do you blame yourself why do you grieve and repent and hesitate just shoot the arrow no killing is possible at all i getting it do it because it is needed arjun do it selflessly arjun do it as the highest service do it as an absolute joy come on do it for fun arjun you are not playing you are playing not playing is the mistake that you are making right now you are suffering arjun and the reason is not that you are committing a sin the reason is that you are taking this little sport this momentary drama too seriously that's the reason you are suffering your understanding of your suffering is flawed you are thinking that it is the horrible load of the moment that is crushing you down no 
there is nothing momentous happening right now what is happening right now has been happening since eternity and even at this moment it's happening everywhere things are rising things are falling nothing unique nothing special is happening on this battlefield but you are suffering and the reason is incorrect interpretation you are assuming something extremely significant is happening here nothing of any significance is happening here just play you are not supposed to fight just play the real is anyway beyond your comprehension beyond your reach and beyond your arrows so then what are you to do and just play with these little toys that you have come on and you are suffering just as a kid suffers when he doesn't get to play you are being too serious a kid arjun you getting it hmm irrespective of how important something appears its importance is always limited of unlimited importance is only that the one the destination therefore never hesitate never hesitate even the object that carries the greatest important in this entire universe has the value of a particle of sand in front of the infinite when you understand then you don't demur getting it what is the value of the highest number in front of infinity a upon b b is infinity a is open to your imagination give the highest number possible to a what's the value of this fraction zero always zero irrespective of how big your a is a by b is always zero there are only two kinds of people remember those who look at a and those whose vision is a little broader they look at a upon b whenever a starts appearing too big open your eyes a little wider and look at a upon b you will be saved else the moment will eat you up in any moment when any object in the entire universe starts appearing too big its importance starts growing on you hmm then just ask what's the value of a by b the answer will save you otherwise a can take colossal proportions a trillion ha oh, trillion now that's that's too much it grows big on you a trillion now just that divide that trillion by infinity the resultant 
we said will save you otherwise there is so much in this universe that is so capable of swallowing you alive you will be gone in a blink don't you see how we refer to the universe oh the eternal universe how do you feel when confronted with a number like 10 to the power 44 i say you know this is the size of the universe in meters <sighs> and you are not even 2 meters 10 to the power 44 or that famous Avogadro thing 10 to the power 23 how do you feel? you have to count the zeros twice to be accurate you feel so little so small in front of so much in the universe what will come to save you then? B now A is something you cannot escape or avoid. A comes to you via all your senses. All your senses are bringing A to you all the time. They are not. B is something that you have to effortfully, with great love, remember. And that is what is called as constant remembrance. A need not be remembered. A is indispensable. Irrespective of where you go, whether you close your eyes, open your eyes, you look this way, you look that way, A will keep pouring in. That's the function of the senses. And if all the senses are closed, the mind will generate colossal A's through memory. So A is a given. It will always be there. In the field of consciousness, A is always present as an object. B is not. B is not. So we said there are only two kinds of people. Both the kinds have A, but only one of them have B. A is a compulsion, B is a choice. As long as the body is there, multiple A's will be there every moment. B is not compulsory, B is not automatic, B is a matter of love. B is a matter of paying the price. B is a matter of remembering that which you can so easily forget. B is a matter of not yielding to the fear or temptation of A's. B is the antidote to all kinds of A's. If you don't have B in your life, we said A's will swallow you alive. Right now, Arjun is in the process of being gobbled up by memories, emotions, social conditioning, fear, all these are swallowing him. And this is when he has someone standing right next to him who is the very incarnation of B, who is so much capable of bringing B to Arjun. And still, you see, this is Maya. 
still you see Arjun is being forgetful. Arjun cannot look at the complete picture. He is looking at just the numerator. Verse 24 says, the self cannot be cut, burnt, wetted or dried. It is changeless, all-pervading, unmoving, immovable and eternal. How to read it? Arjun, all that you are seeing in front of you, is there anything in it that cannot be cut, cannot be burnt, cannot be wetted, cannot be dried? Is there anything out there? No, nothing. Therefore, none of that is the self. The self cannot be cut, but whatsoever you are seeing Arjun in front of you, that can be cut. Therefore, it is not the, hence it is not to be taken seriously. Come on kid, pick up your toys and play. What are you being so serious about? See, the truth is attributeless. Nirguna. Hmm? But it becomes very useful when you say that all the attributes belong to the false. If you will say the self cannot be cut, to you it does not hold any meaning because you have never seen anything that cannot be cut. Have you ever seen anything that cannot be cut? No. So if you say the self cannot be cut, it is a beautiful statement. But to the ego, it is relatively less useful. It becomes far more useful when you just invert the whole thing. And you say, this means that everything that can be cut is just an object to the ego. Now I am liberated. I look at stuff that can be wetted or dried or created or destroyed and I will say, I am not going to take you seriously, dude. Because you are not the self. Had you been the self, Had you been the self, you could not have been cut or dried or picked or dropped or made or unmade. Since you can be made and unmade, remembered and forgotten, therefore you are not the self. Hence, I am not going to give you the maximum place possible. I will give you the right place. But the highest chair is, is reserved for somebody else. Not that I am going to throw my boot at you. Huh? Not that I am going to kick you away from my presence. But I am not going to give you the highest chair. I will befriend you. I will help you. Or I will seek help from you. That's the only light relationship possible between the two of us. Let me be of use in the process of your liberation. And let you teach me something with respect to liberation. That is the only right relationship. So that relationship the two of us can have. But I'll not accord you the highest chair. That belongs to somebody else. That's the way to read the Gita or the Upanishads hmm? or anything in the corpus of Vedant or anything in the corpus of any philosophy that aims at liberation which effectively means much of the Shad Darshan, the six classical philosophies. Even Buddhism, even Jainism, because they too aim at mukti or liberation. That is the way you, you read the verses, the sutras.